it's such a pleasure to be here. It's been mentioned to me that a special need for the department or for the center is that students often have no interest in economics. I don't know why, but, and it's hard to gather their interest. So that actually is the focus of what I'll be speaking about here today. So don't be fooled when it looks like at the be beginning, I am completely on a different topic. You'll begin to see that it will tie back in to what we most want to be learning about. I know all of you have uh, heard of ChatGPT and, and you maybe have a little sense of what it does. Let's step back and look at what ChatGPT actually does. So let's say you have a question like, what are the fundamental principles of Austrian economics regarding market behavior? Well, what ChatGPT is doing is it's saying, how do all these words in this sentence relate to one another? And more than that, it's saying, how, what do we know about Austrian economics? How do all those words and all those concepts relate to what I'm asking here? So what ChatGPT is doing, it is, it, it, it's finding relationships between, when it reads millions of words of text, it actually figures out patterns in what's going on. And those patterns of, of how the words relate to each other, turns out they're very meaningful to us as answers to questions, either questions or answers to questions. So um, let's say that we ask this question of ChatGPT. Well, ChatGPT can come, you know, I'm just kind of making up you know, some kind of text that it might go out and learn about, you know, about Austrian economics or koalas or whatever it's learning about. And it's also relating all of that to your question. So ultimately, what it's doing is it's taking each word in the question you're asking, focusing on it, and seeing how it relates in the greater universe of all the words it scanned on the internet to the words that are in our sentence. So there's a foundational paper um, that came out in 2017, and it just says, how do we relate all these words to one another and do it in a very quick and easy way? They were trying to find out how to relate the words to one another, but everything was very computationally intensive until this paper was published. And it's actually still computationally uh, intensive. But uh, what it found was there's a way to get the computer to like look at one word or one phrase or one set of words and very rapidly related to everything else it knows. And this foundational paper, is, it was published by Google or um, uh, people from who were related to Google. Um, and it's called Attention is All You Need. And what it did was introduce the idea of a transformer. But really what the transformer is doing is taking the sentence that I put in the question, it's encoding it, and then it is decoding, that is putting out a sentence or phrases or paragraphs or even books that are a consequence of the question, the prompt that I put in, the question I've asked. So, um, so the, the thing is, this is actually, uh, seems very complex, and it is, but it's what the brain is doing. We put in a set of words. It outputs a sequence of words. So the first word comes out, it feeds back in, and then the next word comes out, 
and so forth. So you have sentences and paragraphs uh, and essays that evolve. And this is exactly what the human brain is doing. I'm making a little circle. See that red line that is going around? That's the same red line loop. It's doing a very similar process to what our brain is doing. So, so let's, I'm just going to remind you, I know many of you are familiar already with the concepts of learning, but let's just do a quick review of the, of the idea that when you're learning something, you're making connections between neurons in the brain. And, uh, and those connections are strengthened through lots of practice, you know, and what, what you're doing is creating connections as you learn something. And those connections strengthen through practice. So you're creating these clusters of connected neurons. And of course, if you don't practice, then what happens is those little synapses fall away and you don't have any connections anymore. So what you're doing is you're creating these sets of links of connections uh, within the brain. So one thing I want to uh, mention, you know, these, these links get strengthened. This relates to what you know um, already. So you learn it and you've got these sets of links. And when you know something already, then you can use, you can more easily teach something to someone if you remind them of what they already know and use that as, uh, a, and use a metaphor to introduce them to the new idea. So, uh, for example, if you already know how water flows, that you can use that water flow as a metaphor to introduce the uh, students to the new idea of electrical current flow. So um, metaphors are extremely valuable in learning. And what they're doing is just, you know, building, taking what you already know and using it as a kind of a rough foundation to springboard you onto something new. Of course, you know, metaphors, they only fit uh, in certain ways. So they, they may fit to teach a new idea, but for other aspects of that new idea, they may not work. So you can have a good metaphor, but it'll break down after a while. So, you know, in my metaphor of water flow, is a good metaphor for electrical current flow. Actually, it breaks down if you go and look at a, a, a quantum level. It doesn't work very well. So metaphors, in fact, are a powerful tool for learning. And uh, how do you come up with metaphors? Well, guess what? <laughs> Chat GPT is like so good. So I went in and I asked ChatGPT, what, what are concepts in economics that students often goof up on? And it said, it, it, students sometimes really, they, they mix up microeconomics and macroeconomics. And I thought, okay, well, if that's true, what's a metaphor that we could use to help them understand there's a difference between these two concepts. So it said, well, why don't you compare them to the different lenses used on a camera by a photographer? So my macroeconomics is like using a wide angle lens and microeconomics might be a lens that narrows the focus. So you're looking more deeply, you know, at some particular aspects. I said, well, that's not good enough. You know, I want another metaphor. So it said, why don't you compare them to layers on a multi-layered cake? And microeconomics is, or macroeconomics is like looking at the top layer and microeconomics is looking at the deeper layers. So then I asked it to come up with a picture 
And it kind of came up with a picture, but it's kind of a funny picture. So here's what, uh, there's a concept called word vectors. And every single concept um, or every single word, there'll be words that it often appears very close to. You know, so altruism and benevolence actually are quite similar in meaning when taken, um, when you uh, look at, the, at what's actually out there on the internet right now. People normally use those terms in very interchangeable ways. So word vectors are a way of quantifying how similar the contexts are between two words. So what it is is like, it's a little, every word has a connection to every other word, right? I mean, how it's commonly, how it, um, how often it is kind of close to those words when you look at the greater context of things. Every word um, that we have, if you look at three-dimensional space, it has, um, you know, it has, like we can be physically located in space two inches up, three inches over, you know, five inches this way. So every physical location in space has a directional pointer towards, you know, or that, that place. In word space, um, every word has a, a dimension that points to every other word. So instead of having three dimensions, like physical space, words can have tens of thousands of dimensions. So every single word, it has a vector, uh, you know, that relates it to other words. So one thing I, I want to say, so within the brain, we have, um, you know, everyone has probably heard the word dopamine, and you know it's somehow related to, uh, like, gambling, you know, the getting addicted to gambling, getting addicted to anything. And actually, indeed, um, dopamine is released within the brain when we get unexpected rewards. So, if, so it's kind of like, if you live in a good house and everything is all great for you, um, it's all expected. And so you don't like get dopamine released uh, as a consequence. But if you were going to move into a big mansion or a better house, then that would feel really rewarding and exciting if, if it suddenly was something that you know, came into your life and you got. So, you know, dopamine is released when you have an unexpected reward. And um, it's released uh, throughout the brain, um, it, you know, like in states of anticipation of a possible uh, reward. And then when you get that reward, it, it actually is really released in that circumstance. Interestingly, when they did experiments on these poor little mice, and they, let's just say, they disabled their dopamine systems, what happens is those mice can't learn anything new. So dopamine is really important for learning. Unanticipated uh, rewards actually help with learning. So if you ever notice some professors, like you, you hang outside their class, and you can tell the students are kind of hanging because they're excited about, oh, well, something's going to happen. Um, our our chat just was here, and he, he does magic as a side hobby. So he would do a little bit of, oh, suddenly there's a release of flames. You bet they were all quite interested in what he had to say because 
It was kind of an unexpected and pleasant surprise, and they learned a lot from his lecture. So what is going on when you're learning? It's, let's say that you're trying to figure out a problem, you know, maybe in economics or whatever um, philosophy, that's always the toughest one for me. And so you try some approach to figuring out the solution, and it doesn't work. So you try another approach, it doesn't work. And so you try another approach, and it doesn't work. And now you're seeing I'm running out of room, so something's got to happen. And indeed, you try yet one other approach, and you get a solution. That actually feels good when you get that solution, and that sprinkles dopamine along that particular trail. And that is how those little, you remember how I said those, those connected cluster of neurons when you learn something? That's how they get cemented together, is dopamine plays a major role. Now, it's not like those other things that you were doing when you were learning um, are useless. Oftentimes, they're like little bits and pieces that also helped you with your learning. But if you are curious about something, what that curiosity does is it helps enhance your ability to focus. And this is what happens. You are starting to focus on something. Quite literally, what you're focusing on becomes so interesting that they've done studies, the rest of your visual field will kind of gray out a little bit. And you will be able to intensely focus on whatever you're learning. So this is why um, uh, focusing like this, actually, you can kind of tell it a little bit in your students, because the little iris in their eye, if you look at the pupil, it'll get very large when they have uh, a sincere focused attention, and it'll get small when they're just daydreaming. So they often use this when they're trying to figure out uh, in a classroom whether students are, at, during research studies, to see when students are focusing and when they're just kind of mind wandering. So really what you're trying to do, part of what you're trying to do with those prompts that we just talked about, um, you know, is to figure out things your students are interested in and then see what kind of, you, you know, how can you get them, you know, take that interest that they already have and connect it in some way with what you're teaching. You know, if you ask ChatGPT, it can help you to focus better uh, or to get, help your students to be able to focus more effectively and to actually start being curious and interested in what you're trying to teach. So I just want to remind you of this idea that we've got, I mean, there's, a, there's lots of different aspects of memory, but a good way to conceptualize human memory is that we have this temporary working memory, which is in the prefrontal cortex. And we can think of it as being kind of like an octopus because it can only hold a few things in mind. It's, you might think of it as a quadrupus. It's got four arms on it. See those little, uh, little arms there. And the other um, um, part of memory is that long-term memory, which is scattered all over your brain. And that's where you're storing all those little sets of links, those neural links. So when you're learning something new, your very limited working memory is serving as a, a kind of a funnel. And you, it has to go through this limited working memory in order to be able to make those, those sets of links that you're storing in long-term memory. So it, you know, you're, you're figuring something out. You can't, that's why you can't get like too much information thrown at you at once like at the Antigua Forum, and it's really hard to process um, all this information because you have only a limited working memory. 
And of course, though, once you might use that working memory to create those links in long-term memory, which is a pretty unconscious process, you can much more easily pull those links to mind, and then you can hold more information than you can. You can create long sets, large sets of links that you can pull to mind. So that's why even if you can only hold four pieces of information, but one of those pieces relates to you know, uh, an economic relationship with an equation that you're holding in that, you know, with that arm, it actually can hold a lot of information. So our, our goal is to get students to understand concepts and, um, uh, you know, kind of build those, build in long-term memory a lot of the ideas that we're trying to teach about so they can easily connect them together. If they don't build them in long-term memory, they take a test and they're completely confused. Now, the thing is that working memory capacities vary. So on average, people can hold four items in working or four pieces of information that can be larger pieces if you've practiced a lot. Some people hold lesser things. So I'm a lesser capacity working memory. My colleague, Terry Sanowski, is like a super big working memory capacity. But what is ChatGPT doing? It is helping to make at your fingertips the biggest working memory ever seen. It can hold all of this information at once, and that's all of the information it is scraping from the web. So this is why we can ask it about all these different things, but ChatGPT has a million times, you know, maybe more, far more than that, the information that we have in our own brains because it has really scraped, and it's all available to it at once. But it is getting better all the time. And this is why it's so valuable, though, is because it can just hold all this information in memory all at once. Now, why do I use something like Claude 2 to input information sometimes, even though it's only chat GPT, you know, it's only the version 3.5. I use that because I can, um, I can often upload more documents for it to hold in its working memory kind of at once, to have right handy, and I say, see this uh, document on, the, on pathological altruism? You can analyze it, you know, you can upload like Let's say that you wanted to build a chat bot that could answer questions about Austrian economics. Here's the instructions for how you could do that. You, you could build it as an enhancement to what's going on, on you know, for the center and have it right there. The, here's uh, the URL of that particular set of instructions about how to put material on and create your own chatbot. The people will be able to access it who um, purchase ChatGPT+. But let's say that all of the professors in the school have access to ChatGPT+. You could load all these materials on Milton Friedman, uh, you know, Hayek, uh, Mises, uh, everything you want, and probably most of it is already available, um, you know, because you have to be aware that whatever you're loading could be used as training material by ChatGPT. It is a, um, an excellent, resource like a, like having a good buddy that can look over your shoulder about what you're doing. Um, I just, I, I'm still boggled at what it's doing and why and how it does it. But hopefully this has given you a little sense of, you know, why it's so powerful, how it's 
It's like the human brain, but it, in some sense, takes some of the, thing, the restrictions that we have when we're thinking and gets around them. Um, it, it's, it's really pretty cool stuff.